Uh, it is a great honor to introduce our captain. He has been an inspiration to my reset, great mentor, and it is always a pleasure to collaborate with him. He's a professor of economics and director of the Center of Economic and Social Research, CESAR, at the University of Southern California. Before confounding CESAR at USC in 2013, he was the director of the Labor and Population Division at the Rand Corporation. Professor Captain has extensive contributions in economic of aging, retirement, consumption, and saving pensions, and in particular for this conference, the economic of well-being of elderly. For his contribution of economic research, he has received a large number of honors and awards, such as the knighthood in the Order of Netherlands Lion in 2006. He's also a leader in the development of new methods of data collections. Please welcome Ari Captain. Thank you, Raquel. Um, had I known that he was going to talk about a knighthood, I would have brought my sword and my horse. Um, the, it's one of these things that is a remnant of a very old past. It's sort of surprising that a country like the Netherlands even awards things like knighthoods. It's a country where the queen rides her bike, where the king celebrates with the Olympic athletes in Rio when they, when they win a gold medal. And we really don't like titles and we don't like uh, formalities. And, and uh, in many ways, you know, you shouldn't take these things all that seriously. Um, on to a more important and perhaps a little less uh, interesting, a little less exciting, but uh, a topic um, about the future elderly. Uh, this morning when I looked at my slides, uh, I realized that uh, the title in the program is a little misleading. So I, entered, I inserted the word uh, American in the title because I realized all I'm going to talk about uh, are Americans and about American experiences and the extent to which Americans are prepared for retirement. So whenever I say something negative, or you're not from the US, you don't have to take any of this personally. Uh, but I do think that there are lessons in, in the stories I'm going to tell that uh, probably are universal, in, certainly in terms of implications for policy. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about a number of papers, really, that I've written with several co-authors. And um, it gets a little repetitive. So you will, you will sort of hear me say the same thing over and over again based on different uh, things we have done. It's also a bit of a trip back in time. I'll start with something you have done recently, and then gradually you'll sort of go back in time a little bit. And, but, but you'll see the same theme coming up uh, quite a bit. So the, if you look at the, the table of contents, um, it doesn't necessarily uh, tell you exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm first going to talk a little bit about you know, the financial situation of elderly in, uh, in the United States. Then I'll start talking about their knowledge of the system in which they have to make decisions, particularly Social Security, which is by far the most important uh, program in the United States to support uh, elderly. Uh, and then we get more to the extent to which people understand how to make decisions, the kind of crucial decisions they have to make, and how to deal with it, what they know, what they don't know. And I may run out of time, and it doesn't really matter because you know, by the third time you have heard me say the same thing, you can sort of guess what the fourth time is going to be. So we'll sort of see how it plays with time. I think the, the idea is that I'll talk for about 45 minutes, we'll have time for a discussion. Uh, generally, I like to be interrupted, but may, this room may not be quite uh, conducive to that, but in general, I, I much more prefer uh, a conversation than, uh, than a straight uh, presentation. But, I'll go ahead, you know, whenever you have a question, definitely I'll be happy to answer them either during the talk or, or later. So, um, so this is just you know, sort of an obvious statement, particularly to people like me, which is that if you, go older, if you grow older, you actually get dumber also. So um, particularly your memory goes down gradually, and at some point, people's decision-making capabilities uh, also go down. And I'm just quoting two papers, but there are quite a few more. So, so if you look at financial decision making, which is really what I'm going to talk about, there are two competing uh, phenomena. One is if you're young, then uh, you may not know a whole lot. You don't have experience. You haven't done this before. And then in the, so at middle age, you're probably pretty good at that. But then you grow older, and then at least for some of us, 
our mental capabilities start falling and there, there is a concern of you know, to which extent people at really old age are still able to make sound decisions. And I'll come back to this theme a little bit. Um, so, this is the first, so this is the first paper we're going to talk about. And some of these papers are very descriptive. You know, essentially, I'm going to pick a couple of tables from them, show a graph, but try to convey a general message as to what's going on. Uh, and a lot of this uh, has been supported by either the National Institute on Aging or by the Social Security Administration in the United States, and sort of for obvious reasons if you, if you look at what I'm going to talk about. So this is something that um, we have done recently, but it's really a follow-up of something that we did uh, a number of years ago. Um, so the Federal Reserve Board in the United States at some point wanted to learn more about the financial situation of older Americans. Um, so, and I was at RAND still at the time, and so we did a survey in what's called the American Life Panel, which is an online panel, an internet panel. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a second because it's similar to, the, to another data set that I'm currently involved in, and the, and the, the structure is the same, so I'll, I'll just leave that for a second. So essentially, the idea is to look at older adults and see how they're doing. Um, so this was in 2012. Now, 2012 was still in the middle of the financial crisis, uh, more or less, maybe a little uh, past the, the peak. Uh, so the question is really what has happened since then, since after all the economy has recovered quite a bit since then. Um, so in, in starting in 2015, but it's actually still in the field, we started essentially doing the same survey in which we asked a pretty large question to Americans about their financial situation, you know, how they deal with financial emergencies, and generally you know, how much they have actually thought about retirement and, and, and in general about how to take care of that financial well-being uh, at all the ages. So the, the environment I'm using for this data collection is called the, the Understanding America Study, which is a, an internet panel of about 6,000 uh, respondents, 18 and over, living in the US. Uh, and these respondents, about once or twice a month, are asked questions. So essentially, they get an email saying, we have questions for you. you know, if, if, could you please uh, go to a website and answer these questions? They get paid. They get paid at about $20 for 30 minutes of questions. Um, importantly, they're recruited by address-based sampling. That is, it's based on uh, addresses we get from the US Postal Office. And then we send them letters. And there's a whole process of trying to recruit them into the sample. And if they don't have internet, then we give it to them. So, and it, so what they get, they, they get a tablet, and they get internet access. Now, coming back to the American Life Panel that I just mentioned, and also, because I'll refer to the American Life Panel, the AOP, a number of times, and also other papers I'm going to talk about, the system is pretty much the same. So also there, people are recruited not uh, over the internet, but recruited by different ways, for example, by random digit dialing or by sending letters. So the important thing in all these cases is what you try to do by doing that is cover the part of the population that may not have internet access. And that's particularly pertinent for older people, because internet access is still uh, less prevalent among older people than among uh, younger people. Um, and of course, as a result of doing that, and it's a panel and we ask them these questions, you have an enormous amount of information about them. So you have all this background information that we have. We know a lot about uh, uh, financial information. We know about their health. We know about their personality. We know about their mental problems. Uh, we, we do cognitive tests, uh, et cetera. So just to give you, you know, some sense of <clears throat> where Americans are, and these are all weighted data, so, so we use uh, sample weights to make it representative of the population. I'm just going to, uh, going to show you a few graphs that give you some hint as to so where people are in, in, in the older age uh, range. So this is a question where people are asked whether they actually thought about retirement or thought about planning for retirement. And as you can see, most people in the age range 50, 59 didn't. Um, if you go to older ages, you know, the number of people who say they did is, is bigger, but there's still a pretty big chunk of people haven't really thought about it and haven't, didn't and of course, some of these people may, have say, may say no because they retired more than three years ago. But there is really a large number of people who really don't give a lot of attention to that, which then feeds into other things, which is they're actually not all that well prepared, as we all see. Um, and if you look at where they are in terms of, their, let's say, their assets or their financial situation, you can see that in the age range 60, 69, more than half still have a mortgage debt. Um, and even at uh, 70 plus, there is still a big chunk of people with a mortgage debt. So it's definitely not the case that you have sort of a traditional pattern where people buy a house at early age and they may borrow money and at some point they're old enough and they've paid off all their, all their debts and then they retire. 
You definitely don't see this across the board. You see this, you see a pretty, you see really big part of the population not uh, having quite made that. And you can tell similar stories about credit card debt, for example. Um, in the age group 60, 69, you see that a little more than half pay off the balance of the credit cards every month, but then almost half don't pay off uh, all of it, and some only pay the minimum, and some have actually trouble keeping up at all. And 70 plus is a little better, but there's still considerable parts of the population that have, uh, you might suspect trouble managing their money and, and have trouble paying off, for example, the credit card debt. Um, one other question that, that has been asked in many surveys is, you know, imagine something happens and you suddenly have to come up with $1,000. Could you do that? And if you look at this, these numbers are not big, right? I mean, it's like 11% 70 plus. On the other hand, it is only $1,000 and it's still 11%. And if you ask the same question about 10,000, suddenly these numbers really get very big. And 10,000 isn't a big number either. If you think of the need to have a car, your car breaks down, you have to buy a new car. And these things then really start affecting people's livelihood. So what this also signifies is inequality. There is, of course, many people have no trouble paying 10,000 or any number, but then there are a pretty large part of the population that uh, are you know, living at the edge almost, right? And they're vulnerable, and, and that's, I think, the word you want to use. So, so if you sort of look at that, I think the general um, impression is that they may be doing okay. On average, you know, the majority will be doing okay, but there is a significant part of the population that uh, clearly has some trouble managing money and has maybe more obligations, more debt they have to service than, uh, than will be optimal given their, uh, given their age. So that's sort of a story about where they are. In, 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 with a bird's eye view, just a, you know, a very uh, brief summary of, of what the situation is of all the Americans. All the next presentation, all the next papers I'm going to talk about are really about knowledge and about decision making. Because at the end of the day, in, in, an, in an environment, and the US is probably one of the prime examples, in an environment which you have to make your own decisions, where most of your own financial well-being in all the age is a function of how well prepared you are, how much you understand the decision you have to make. What's important then is to understand, what to know what people actually understand about the environment in which they make decisions. So, so this is one where we ask people a whole number of questions about what they know about Social Security. Social Security is by far the most important old age uh, program in the United States if it comes to financial security. There is, of course, Medicare, which is extremely important for, for health insurance, but in terms of financial preparing for uh, old age, social security is very important. So, and there are, there are many choices that have to be made within social security system. So again, it's important to see what people know about it. Now, this is another paper that actually uh, is an update of something we did in the past. So in 2010, we did a couple of studies. One was a telephone study, another one was an uh, internet study in the American Life Panel, which I mentioned before. And then what we did in 2016, we uh, updated uh, what we found. So the telephone panel is called MGA, stand, standing for Matthew Greenwald and Associates. And then we have the American Life Panel, AOP, and then we have the Understanding America study, which is called UES. And I'm saying that because otherwise you don't understand the next graph. So this is just a very simple question. Please tell me how knowledgeable you feel about how the social security system works. Uh, so MGA, that's a telephone panel in 2010, AOP, internet 2010, UAS, internet 2016. And if any, so first of all, if you go from the bottom to the top, then um, at the bottom, the blue, the, these are the people who say that they're, they feel very knowledgeable, right? So blue is the good news and then Red is a little not so great, and if you go all the way to the top, it's actually pretty bad. And if you look from left to right, you see that, if anything, the uh, situation has not improved. It's not the case that in 2016, people know more, or feel they know more than in 2010. Um, you can ask more specifically, for example, do you know how your benefits change if you claim Social Security benefits sooner or later? And for those of you who are not familiar with the system, the, uh, the level of benefits is a steep function of the age at which you claim. So if you claim at 62, you get a certain amount of money. If you manage to wait until 70, you get 76% more. So it makes an enormous difference whether you claim early or late. So you have, at least it's important to know that in order to make a decision about when to claim. And so, so many people feel that they really don't, uh, don't really know this very well. Um, so, you know, slightly more objective way to uh, elicit knowledge is just to do a quiz. So, uh, so this is a quiz and we just 
tally the number of correct answers, and I'll show you the results in a second. So here are questions, and all Americans are supposed to know it, although you'll find that they don't. Uh, but I'll give, you, I'll give you the answers to this in case uh, you're not familiar with the American system. So, the f so these are uh, true or false questions. So someone who has never worked for pay may still be able to claim benefit if one's spouse qualified for Social Security. And the answer is that's true, because that's the, indeed if you have a spouse who works, you can still get some. Social Security benefits are not affected by the age at which someone starts claiming. That's obviously false, and it's important to know that. Social Security benefits are adjusted for inflation. That's true. Um, Social Security benefits have to be claimed as soon as someone retires. And that's an important one, because that's definitely not true. That's, th these are completely independent, when you claim and when you retire. And still, the terminology, for example, talk about retirement benefits. So you can, there is also a lot about the terminology in Social Security in the US that has an historical explanation, but is misleading, because it, it sort of leads people to think there is a relation that really there isn't. Um, then it says retired people who continue to earn income from working on investments may have to pay tax on their Social Security benefits. That's true. Uh, and the Social Security is paid for by a tax placed on both workers and employers, and that's true too. And then there's one more question in which they have to pick one of these. Um, so, and, and so here you have a number of possible uh, answers to the question, which of the following best describes how a worker's Social Security benefits are calculated. Uh, and the second bullet point is the answer. They are based on an average of highest 35 years of your earnings, but many people don't know that, and they give all, they, all the other answers are, are ticked also. So let's sort of look uh, where this, how this then varies across different groups in society. So on the left, you have uh, the answers to the questions I've just shown you. So both the self-reported questions, how, how knowledgeable they are, and then uh, the, the toll bars are the percent correct. So the left side, you have the complete sample weighted. And then to the right, you have age. And you see that, for ex if you just look at the blue bars, you see it goes up by age, which is good news in some ways, because there isn't too much reason why young people would have to know this. But then, of course, if they grow older, they get closer to uh, the decision they, they really should know about this. But it also goes up with income. And that's a little less good news. At, because uh, particularly people with lower income are the ones for whom Social Security is important. Although this is conflated with age also to the extent that younger people make less money, of course. It goes up as education. People with lower education are less knowledgeable, as you would probably expect. And it varies by race and ethnicity. And that's always found. So whites are always doing better on all these uh, tests than anyone else. Blacks and Hispanics are usually uh, lowest. And then you have the other ethnicity, which includes Asians, for example. Uh, and the demographics, males no more, married people no more, females no less, and unmarried no less. And that's important too, because if you look at the vulnerable groups, and I'll probably get to that, um, the vulnerable groups are really the females and the unmarried, the singles. They are the ones who need Social Security more than anyone else, and of course, if they're the ones who know least about it, that's not good news. So that's really sort of where we are. I mean, and, and this summarizes pretty much what I said. It doesn't, feel, it doesn't seem anything has improved since 2010. Um, and, I, and personally, I blame uh, the complicated Social Security terminology partly for that. And we're doing a project uh, for Social Security, actually, in which we experiment with a number of different names. For those of you uh, who know the US system a little bit, there is a number of these terms, like there is a delayed retirement credit. Um, which is a completely misleading term in many ways. First of all, no one knows what it means, but it also suggests that you get more money if you retire later. It actually has nothing to do with retirement. It's, uh, it has to do with when you claim. Um, there is the full retirement age, which people then take as sort of a, a cue as to when they should retire. And really, that's a number that has essentially no meaning either. It, it, it leads to a little kink in the actuarial adjustment that you get by the, the amount of extra money you get by claiming a year later. But there's really no meaning in any real sense. So there is a whole, this whole notion that you could really simplify things uh, tremendously. And you know, this may go into a little, much too much de uh, little too much detail, but really, there are only a couple of takeaway messages. So if you look at the bottom, there is a claiming win window between 62 and 70. Uh, if you claim later, you get more. Uh, it's inflation protected. Uh, and then you have to say something about the fact that if you have made more money during your life, you will get more, you will get more benefits, and there is a relation to spousal earnings. And with some luck, you can sort of you know, teach most people that, those five bullet points. 
And I think what's happening here is what usually, I think what often happens in policy is that the policymakers, and I think economists are sort of the worst of the lot if it comes to that, know, of course, understand the topic much better than anyone else. And then we try to be precise, and we also sort of somehow do justice to the past in, in terminology. And we end up with systems that are incomprehensible except for the, for the experts. And of course, in a situation where people have to make many decisions, and again, the US is sort of the prime example, that's the last thing you want to do. You want to simplify things, simplify things, simplify things. And the, there is definitely scope for improvement. And of course, at some level, that's great, because this doesn't really require any major political decision. It's just, you know, let's just, let's just do a better job at, at the way we communicate the parameters of the system. All right, so these, these were the, so these were the most, most recent um, things we have done, and also they are the most, um, um, you might say, um, descriptive, easy, uh, easy to, to understand. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about uh, papers that are a little more complex, go a little deeper into people's capability of actually making decisions in this context, uh, and I'm also, as I said, I'm also going back in time a little bit. So this is a paper that's about to be published, uh, but he wrote it a couple of years ago. As you know, certainly in economics, it may take a while before a paper finds a home. It finally did. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about the whole paper, but I'll, I'll try to give you some of the, the sort of the um, most, I think, uh, pregnant, uh, per, most, not pregnant, pertinent uh, um, findings that I think help us again understanding what, uh, how, what people can and cannot do. Um, so, you know, this slide is, has, is sort of the typical economics slide that essentially, is, so if you look at the United States, uh, as you may know, uh, increasingly people have pension systems outside social security system that's called defined contribution. And defined contribution essentially just means you're saving for your own future. So that means at some point, you know, at some age when you decide that you need the money, you have all this cash sitting in an account somewhere. You know, you may have invested in stocks or somewhere else, but there is, there is money there. And then you have to decide what to do. And of course, you can just decide to take it out and put it in the bank or, you know, um, invest with Bernie Madoff or something else, right? I mean, all of that you can do. And, and, and obviously, not all of it is a good idea. Most economic theory would say you really should annuitize. In other words, what you should do, you should use the money and buy an annuity, that is, buy some fixed monthly income stream for that. And the reason for that is really uh, an insurance part, because there is this risk that you will live longer than you anticipated, and now what? You thought you were going to live until 80, now you're 85, the money is gone, and what are you going to do? And of course, an annuity uh, insures you against that. So that's sort of the, you know, what most economic models would tell you. But then there are some, some, but it doesn't happen, okay? So if you look at what people do, people are way under-annuitized by sort of any model that you can think of. And there are, some reasons are maybe not so strange, like, for example, adverse selection will play a role, by which I mean that if you have just a market without any further regulation, it might be the case that the only ones who are willing to buy an annuity are the ones who, go, who know they're going to live to 100. For, the, for them, it's a really good deal. But for the insurance company, that's not a very good deal, because only the people who live to 100 are their clients, and, and no one dies. Then, of course, they get in trouble with their finances, right? So, so there are arguments why that, might, uh, why, why that might not quite work, but there are, there are studies that show that even if you take that into account, if you look at the pricing of annuities, really many more people should annuitize than, than they do. And then there are other reasons why people may not uh, annuitize, for example, you may want to leave the money to your children, or you may say, well, I don't really need to do that because uh, I'm going to keep the money, and if I get in trouble, my children will support me. I mean, there are all sort of mechanisms that may explain part of it, but the, the long and short of it is that Within sort of main economic theory, it's a little hard to, to rationalize what you see. I mean, and then, so that then gets us um, to maybe other reasons, which is, well, you know, these are really complicated decisions, right? So how much money am I going to pay for an extra $100 a month, for example? And that's really what, what uh, I'll talk about. So if you don't understand that product, you, you, get, you become very reluctant to do anything, right? You, you're going to buy a car, you don't really understand anything about cars, you don't know what the value is, you're going to be reluctant. You say, well, maybe I shouldn't do it. And then there are things like, well, I have this money in the bank, and I'm going to hand this over to you in, in, in return for a promise that, well, you know, who knows what's going to happen. So, so there are these mechanisms that, that may sort of make it difficult for people to make those decisions. Um, 
And what I'm going to show is that indeed that's the case, that people find it very difficult to value this. So the experiment we did, this is also the American Life Panel at Rand, as I mentioned, the one I mentioned before. We asked people a number of questions of this sort. And this is sort of a, sort of a hopeless question because it has these symbols in it. Um, and I'll tell you why. So what happens is that in the panel, we ask people about the earnings history. Uh, so we know sort of what the earnings history was. Given the system of Social Security, we now know what level of Social Security benefits they will get. And so then we personalize. So if you look at this question, so what we say here is we say, well, in this question, we're going to ask you to make a choice between two money amounts. And then they have to choose one of the two, right? So the first one is that you can receive your expected or your current Social Security benefits. So let's say someone expects $1,500. Uh, that, so that would say, well, you get $1,500. So this SSB would um, be $1,500. Or uh, you get, uh, in this case, uh, like let's say X is 100, or you, you get $100 less, but then you get money, OK? So this is an example where um, you would actually sell some of your, of your Social Security because you would you would agree to, to a lower social security level and in return you get cash. So what we do, we ask a whole bunch of these questions with different frames and also we then vary it depending on their answer. What we do by doing that, we can sort of um, bound uh, the value they place on, on a new And this will become clear if, if I uh, show you some more. So this is a screenshot of a question where um, people are selling annuities, right? So here we look at someone, uh, we say, you have a choice between receiving a Social Security benefit of 1,500 per month and 20,000 cash, or you get 1,600 a month, right? So essentially, what's offered, what's offered here is $20,000 for giving up $100 per month, okay? So that's selling annuities. Um, and of course, you can also have one where you buy annuities. So here we say um, you can have the $1,500 a month, or if you want to go to 1,600, like the top uh, bullet point, then you have to pay 20,000, all right? So we ask a whole bunch of these questions, and we vary the amount. So the 20,000 will become 30,000 if people say they, uh, they like it. Uh, if they don't like it, we lower it. So, so what you do is you go until the point where they flip from one answer to the other, and by doing that, you can bound uh, their value, the value they place on uh, $100 a month, essentially, okay? So if you, if you now plot the answers for everyone, you get a uh, cumulative distribution function that looks like this. And it looks a little strange because, as I said, if you look at the way the questions are being asked, you bound the answers. So you have, an under, you have like a lower bound and an upper bound, and what you get here is in between. So here you see the distribution. So the median uh, is about, um, I think it's 18. I'm not quite sure I can actually quite read this, but... Um, yeah, so it's about 18,000, 18, which is actually sort of actu actuarially fair on the reasonable assumption. But you see there is an enormous variation. So some people uh, you know, think that this should, should essentially give away the $100. So they ask very little money for it, and then others ask an enormous amount of money. And for instance, if you look at the distribution, 6% reports a valuation of 1,500 or lower. In other words, to give up $100 a month, they're okay with $1,500 cash. In other words, so unless you think you're going to live less than 15 months, that's not a particularly good deal, right? On the other hand, 12% want 200,000 or more. So there, so let's say that you think that you can get a rate of return of 1%, which will give you 2,000 a month. That's already more than uh, the $100 a month, right? So you have on both sides of the spectrum, you have people where you think, well, this may be a little unreasonable. So this is the selling, okay? So now I'm going to show you a graph that, ha that has a previous graph, but also shows you the distribution of what people are uh, willing to pay if they buy, right? This is all about how much do I want if I sell. And now we're going to talk about how much do people are willing to pay if they buy. And so you have seen the rightward graph you've seen before. That's the one I showed before. Now the one on the left is the one that's the buying one. And of course, what you see, it moves tremendously because there the median is about 3,000. So in other words, what you find is that People want a lot of money if they sell something, and they're willing to, buy, to pay pretty little if they buy something. And we're talking about, you know, it's not, it's $100 more or less. So you would think these numbers should be pretty much similar, but they are, they are not. They're very different. Um, so what you find really is that people then place a much higher value on Social Security when they're asked to give up some than when, they're, when you ask them, you know, how much are they willing to pay for it. 
And then, of course, you can tell a whole bunch of stories why this might be happening, right? For example, um, you know, often people say that's an endowment effect, which means that whatever you have, you don't want to give it up. I have the annuity, I don't want to give it up. I have the money, I don't want to give it up. And of course, that would explain some of it. But I'll show you a, gr uh, a graph in a second that makes this unlikely. Then there is the notion of liquidity constraints that, well, I really would like to buy more annuity, but I don't have the money. But it turns out if you ask people, could you come up with it? And, and most of them, yeah, no, I could easily come up with that money. But then they say, but I still don't want to do it. And, and they'll say, even if I had the money, I would, wouldn't do it. So it, it feels as if these are not the explanation. But a better way maybe to sort of get at that is to do something else, which we're doing right now. So we did it. So because of this notion that maybe there are sort of personal psychological uh, mechanisms that make it difficult for them to think about this trade, we thought, well, we'll get around that by doing something else. So in the UAS, in the Understanding America study, we um, did an experiment in which we show vignettes. So what you do, you show people a little story. You, know, you, you describe uh, John, John is 60, or no, well, John is 65, and John has to decide you know, whether he wants a lower or a higher annuity, and, and you talk about uh, the amount of money that you think John should pay for that, or he should ask. So the idea is that, by, and you show a number of these vignette persons, these are hypothetical people, and then you ask the respondents to give advice to John, or to Mary, or whatever, whatever name we, we think of. And the idea of that is then, you know, you sort of take away the endowment effect, you sort of take away considerations of personal liquidity constraints. So maybe that helps, and it, it really doesn't. So here, um, this is the, sort of the same graph I showed before, except I've now split the buy and sell graph. Um, and this is based on um, an earlier, you know, rather small sample of a few hundred, but by now we have like 4,000 observations, and it really doesn't change. And so the, the top is once again the selling, the, the, the bottom is the buying, and again you see the same effect. So again you see that people, uh, you know, the amount of money they ask is just enormously higher than uh, the amount of money they would be willing to pay for the same amount. But there's more, because it turns out that buy and sell price are actually negatively correlated. So that is, those who ask most for the $100 are also the ones who are willing to pay least. And that really doesn't make any sense by, by just about any criterion. You know, you, you can, economists are really good at rationalizing just about anything, but I mean, this is, this is pretty hard to do. Um, and, but what you then find, is, and then you can look at inconsistencies, you know, for whom does this hold, and you find something that you would expect. You find that those people who have most trouble in um, valuing annuities, if you like, are the ones who are least financially literate, they have lower education, and they don't score very high numeracy tests. So you, you see a relation that you would expect if this is just a matter of complexity, if it's just a case of people not understanding the decision they're, they're faced with. And I have to re-emphasize re that this is, you know, this is all hypothetical, but these are real decisions that people have to make. At some point, they have a DC plan. At some point, they have to decide how to manage their money until the end of their life. You can also look at extreme values. Remember, I showed you the people who want more than 200,000. I showed you the people who are only asking less than 1,500. If you look at that, the people who, want, who, who produce these extreme values are sort of what you would expect. They are the older respondents, so that speaks to the notion of maybe declining uh, cognitive capability. The people lower education, the minorities, the women, the non-homeowners, people lower income, lower wealth, lower financial literacy. And once again, these are the vulnerable groups, and these are the ones who have the most trouble in, in uh, trying to understand these uh, decisions. So that's, and, that's, and, and this, this pretty much you know, sums it up. So once again, the vulnerable groups are the ones who, uh, who have most trouble in, in, in making decisions that they have to face sooner or later in their life. All right. So. Um, Going even further back in time, so this, given how I'm doing in terms of time, I think I'll, I'll have time to talk about it a little bit also. And also, so I'm going to talk about Social Security claiming, and some of you may have seen this before. But the, so as I said earlier, one of the important uh, decisions is when to claim Social Security. And it really makes an enormous difference whether you claim early at 62 or whether you're able to wait until 70. Uh, so this is based on a paper that actually appeared in the Journal of Risk and Insurance a few years ago with uh, Jeff Brown and Olivia Mitchell. Um, so this is about framing. So essentially, this is going to be a story about the way we tell the story to a, to a respondent will affect what the respondent says he or she wants to do. Okay, so that's really what this is about. And, you know, we've known about framing for quite a while. At first, Jim Kahneman, uh, at least in economics, was sort of the first 
that, uh, that confronted uh, economists with this notion. And by the way, you probably know that uh, Michael Lewis has a book coming out in a few days about Danny Kahneman, right? And, the, and it, looks, it looks fantastic, like all Michael Lewis books, I think. So I think it's, uh, I'm sure it's, I'm going to buy it as soon as I can. So um, this, I, don't, I, don't get commission, I don't get commission for plugging the book, but I, think it's, uh, I really think it's worth, it will be worth uh, reading. Um, so, the, so of course, for an economist, um, it, the, f the fact that framing matters um, is a fundamental problem because our mainstream economic models assume that people make decisions based on the fact of the case, if you like. You know, the certain parameters, the certain things you know, and now you make a decision. The fact that it matters how you present the decision is not something that we typically are very good at accommodating in our models. Right? Yet our models, and I think a lot of policy that's based on economic models, sort of assumes that that's the case. And so, so in that sense, uh, this is another, another, if you like, uh, attempt to show that, that there are some issues in, in how people make decisions. So, so let's talk about social security a little more. And maybe I should have talked about this earlier. So, um, so first of all, as I've now said five times, people can claim between 62 and 70. Um, and there is this notion of full benefits with normal retirement age, and really, I mean, that's one of these things that really has no meaning, as I said, because you can claim late in a full retirement age or early in full retirement age. But it has enormous consequences. So even if you don't work between 62 and 70, just by waiting, you would uh, add 62, uh, 67 percent uh, to your uh, monthly benefit. On the other hand, of course, you give up years of benefits, right? So if you wait a year, you also have. So essentially, what you're doing is you're, you're buying uh, annuities, if you like. So to indicate how important Social Security is, um, and this, this is HRS data that was then uh, used by SSA to explain. This is, this is a few years old, but I don't think it has really changed much. So here we look at um, people who get Social Security, right? So these are the beneficiaries. And we look at for how many, what percent of the people, the Social Security is more than 50% of their income. And you see that 64% across the board, and then a little less for married couples, but then 73% for non-beneficiaries. That's more than half. But more striking, if you look at 90% or more, so now it's pretty much all your income comes from Social Security, then you see that there's still about a third for all beneficiary units, but then for the non-married beneficiary, the singles, it's 43%. So there are big parts of the population for whom Social Security is extremely important. So then the decision to make, you know, when to claim is important too, because it really has an effect on how much money you will have for the rest of your life, okay? So in, what you do in the experiment, um, you know, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm going to try and skip as many details as possible, and to the extent I show details, you can probably ignore them. So, but, you know, it's, I'll show some of it. So what, what we're doing is we're essentially going to talk about different ways we can tell the story and then see how that affects uh, people's... Uh, this, is, I mean, this slide essentially uh, just summarizes what I just said. You know, the, the, the decision is important, and uh, so you want to want to know to which extent people understand it, and to which extent you can people can people sort of get affected by how you tell the story. So, um, so once again, we use the American Life Panel, the Internet Panel at Rand, where people, if they don't have internet, they get it from uh, from us or get it from Rand. Um, and essentially what we did, we showed them a number of different stories about the effect of claiming sooner or later, and then we want to see how that affects their decisions. Um, so, you know, to the extent that, that you worry about this, you have to realize this is what you would call a within-person experiment. So whatever these people, people's circumstances are, you know, whether, whether they have five children or no children, or whether they're sick or not, all of that is kept constant because we only look at differences within people. So, so we don't really have to worry about uh, who they are as long as we look at the effects of, of, uh, of what we do on, on the average response. Um, so what we really try to find out is, you know, to which extent can we move people's decision by having different frames? Uh, and also what we're interested in, given also what I said earlier, is who is most sensitive to framing? Because sensitivity to framing, as you may have got it from now, by now, is something I consider to be bad news. If you're too sensitive to what people tell you, you probably don't quite understand what's going on, right? If someone is selling you a car, can sort of move you, your decision very quickly, that means, well, maybe you didn't quite know what you were talking about when you went to, to the car lot in the first place, and that's sort of what this is, what this is about. So, um, 
So there is just a whole bunch of stories you can tell. So, uh, and, and I'll try to be brief about it. So first of all, there's something called the break-even analysis, which the, the Social Security Administration used until 2008. So break-even is essentially saying, well, you know, you're now 65. Um, you can wait a year. You give up, let's say you give up $20,000 by waiting a year. And you can earn this back because you get more if you wait a year, but you have then have to live at least until 80 in order to earn it back. So that's called the break. So the idea is that's the break-even age. If you give up a year, how many years do I have to live in order to earn back what I was giving up? And people are responsive to that. And also, well, you know, do I really live until 85? Who knows? Maybe I should take the money now. But the problem with that is that it ignores the, the insurance aspect, right? Because it ignores the risk of actually living longer than 85 and suddenly have not a whole lot of income. So that has, was used by SSA until uh, 2008. And then, they and then they decided it wasn't such a great idea. So then they changed it. But like a lot of uh, you know, private uh, advisors still use uh, calculations of that, of that sort. So then, so what are we going to do? We're going to uh, show some sort of baseline that's as neutral as possible. Then we're going to talk about consumption versus investment language. So because you can talk about if you wait a year, you can spend more. But you can also say, well, you know, if, if you wait a year, um, you get a higher return on your investment. So then you talk about the contribution during your life as an investment, and then you talk about the return on investment. And there is some evidence that these things matter. Uh, you can talk about gains versus losses. For example, you can say if you're 65, you get this. If you wait, you get more. That's a gain. You can also say, well, if you're 70, you get this. If you get 69, you get less. That's a loss. And gain-loss frames is another part that has been shown to be important in people's decisions, particularly also by uh, Kahneman and Fursky. And then there's the anchoring age. You know, do you start at 70 and talk about it? Do you, do you start at 62 and talk about it? And again, you would expect some effect because anchoring is another uh, phenomenon that uh, has been found to be important in behavioral uh, science. Uh, and once again, Kahneman and Fursky were pioneers in that. And here, this is just a summary of the var various um, treatments, the various combinations. So there are 10 frames. And you, know, you don't have to pay a lot of attention to this because I'm not, not going to show you any detailed results. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to show you, though, is the following. We find, and that's really the only thing that matters for what I want to talk about, is we find that, indeed, choices are pretty strongly influenced. So this is a very simple experiment, right? You show them some. You tell them a little story. You ask, what, do you, what would you do? And you can move the, the, the claiming age that they say that they're now going to use. So they, if you ask them, what time would you claim? You can move that by about two years just by telling different stories. So nothing changes except the story that you're telling. And once again, what you find is that those people who need Social Security most are the ones who are most sensitive to the story that's being told. So they're the, the vulnerable groups are the ones who are most likely to be um, affected by the way they tell the story. And of course, they're, they're the ones for whom um, you know, this is most important. So let's, so let's get to sort of the final picture of all of this. Right? So this is somewhat impressionistic. It's a number of different papers, different stories, you know, different pieces of facts. Um, but one thing is, I think, you might say, well, why, do you even, why do you even study this? Everyone should know this, right? But I think the evidence is still worth really bringing to the table is financial de decisions are really very difficult. Um, and they're particularly difficult for those people with lower financial or cognitive capabilities. And these are the people who are most vulnerable, certainly at old age. And then bad decisions can have enormous effects. I mean, I, I sort of jokingly, I said, well, you know, you can take the money and, and invest with Bernie Madoff, but people do really do very dumb things. They have all this money, and they may invest it and, 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 and lose a lot of it. So, so there is this whole thing of bad decisions. And, and of course, there's no way back. Once you have made this decision, you're older. Uh, there's really no time to recoup that. And the problem is there is no scope for learning, really, right? I mentioned the, the example of buying a car a number of times. Well, you can do it once or twice, but there, is a, there comes a time when you sort of know what to do. Here, if you make a mistake, there is really very little scope for learning, because usually it's one off, and that's pretty much it. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing is then, you know, if and many people will know that they don't quite know what to do. So the question is, do they seek help? And then coming back to the first paper I talked about, we also asked, you know, do they uh, get help from, from, from professionals, from others? Um, and it turns out that, that really, in sort of the most important decisions, people don't really ask financial professionals very often. I'll like come back to this in a second. Um, and those who do seek assistance, they often rely on friends or family. 
And you know, if you have friends and family who know a lot about this, then uh, maybe that's a good idea, but that's, you know, most people may not ask the person most knowledgeable. Now, the financial professionals are a little bit of an issue too. I mean, certainly in the US, because there are issues of um, incentives, you know, how they get paid, whether it's fee, fee for service or whether they get a percentage of whatever product they sell to the client. So, so it's not the case that, you know, if everyone goes to a financial professional, that's the solution to everything. But I mean, at the very least, you would hope that if people make decisions, they somehow try to inform themselves one way or another. Um, and the other thing that, that in that study we also find is that we also asked, you know, have you made any plans in case you cannot make financial decisions anymore, right? Which is essentially saying, you know, by the time you, 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 your cognitive capability goes down, have you made preparations for that? And really the majority ha hadn't. So most of these people somehow hope that magically they will, ever never, they will never face that problem or somehow the, the, the problem will go away when it happens. So, so the question then is, you know, so what can you do about this? And, and this is still within the US context, but I think this is now relevant to pretty much any other place. So first of all, can you educate people? And the answer is you can to some extent. We have done experiments, uh, controlled, uh, random, controls tri random controlled trials and randomized controlled trials. Um, and, and you do find you can teach people some basic concepts. So that helps a little bit. Um, but it's never going to be the, the complete solution. It's never, there's always... It helps a little bit, but people need more than that. So the other thing is, you know, to which extent does it help to regulate financial products? And the US has sort of gone in that direction more than they used to. Uh, what's going to happen going forward is, uh, is every, anyone's guess. But I mean, that's one of the ways in which um, you can sort of protect people against themselves, if you like, by, 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 re by having regulation that essentially prevents them from making really dumb uh, mistakes. Then you have things like soft paternalism, which has become quite popular, it's default. And these things are known to be pretty powerful, so that helps, so setting defaults that are relatively harmless, and, and if people do that, then at least they will be in reasonable shape. And for example, the Department of Labor in the United States has issued a number of regulations that, that essentially um, make it easier for employers, for example, to offer defaults for people who have a defined contribution plan. But then you can go a little further and you can just be paternalistic. And then if you, and, and now I'm moving to Europe because that's pretty much the European approach in, 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 to a different degree in different countries. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands and um, there, you know, there's, the choice is very limited. There may be a little more than there used to be, but essentially you had a job, the job had an occupational pension plan, that was it. And, um, and the, the point is, though, you, and then you can say, well, you know, as an e economist, like to have a lot of choice, so that's really not good, you know, because you know, choice is welfare enhancing. At least that's what our model tells us. So there have been some uh, surveys in which people then ask, well, would you would you like to make your own choice? And in the Netherlands, it turns out that pretty much no one wants their own choice. You know, people are much happier not to make a choice. They they, they may be happy to complain about what the government is doing, but they prefer not to uh, to make a decision themselves. And we have done focus groups in the United States, and what you see is like, like among people 50, 60, and talk about um, retirement pre uh, preparedness. And what you see, people find it difficult to make decisions, also they find it scary. So they're really worried, that they're really scared about the decision they're going to make because they know it's important and they don't quite know uh, what the decision should be. And then, of course, I think the other thing you may want to do is, as I said earlier, at least, at the very least, try to simplify decisions as much as possible. You know, don't have any unnecessary complications in, uh, in this. So, and I think you probably want to do all of the above, right? You really want to do all of that in one way or another, and depending, of course, on your political view, the extent to which you feel that you should restrict people's choices, the extent to which you feel that people really should make their own choices. So I think the bottom line, which by now I think should be pretty obvious, and I'll, this one second now, uh, uh, is that uh, there is this enormous inequality in people's financial preparedness for old age, both in terms of where they are, that is, you know, the, the amount of money they have, how well off they are, but then also uh, in their capacity to deal with an increasingly complex and life-changing decisions. And, and I think that's a real warning to policymakers. You know, don't make it even more complicated because you're not really helping anyone. Thanks. <clears throat>